Most people think that biologists have great ideas about what to do about climate change and the conservation crisis, but actually, we do not. Today, I'm going to talk about the climate change crisis and how it threatens species and ecosystems and what we might be able to do about it. But before I get into that, I want to tell you about why I care about this. I care about this very deeply. And in preparing for this talk, I thought back and back. And why is it that I really care about this so much? And I was taken back to the time when I was four years old. And uh, my mo this is, of course, me and my brother when I was four years old. And we were, uh, were on, uh, lived on a farm, a dairy farm in Wisconsin. And we spent the greater part of that year, uh, that summer when I was four, in the woods. And at the time, um, I didn't understand why. My mother was not exactly a naturalist. She took us out there because she was trying to keep us away from the debt collectors who were coming to the farm. My parents almost lost their farm that year. And, but meanwhile, I was looking at the flowers. And you can see me here holding a columbine, if you can pick that up. And I can remember being transported by the bright red and yellow and the symmetry of the colors of that flower, and then running on to the next flower and being as equally as enthralled by that. And that's when it happened for me. Now, my mother accidentally turned me into a botanist. She didn't know that. And she also didn't know that I was going to tell you this story today. But the good news about the story about the farm was that, as adults do, they figured it out and they uh, were able to keep the farm. And we grew up, on, my brother and I, on the farm. And we lived the life of farmers. We were taking care of the land. The land took care of us. I developed this wild land ethic. Um, I spent virtually all of my spare time as a child in the woods and developed this very great, deep love and connection with nature. So that's why I did. So now faced with the prospect of climate change and the problem of possibly losing the species and the ecosystems that I love so much, this concerns me very much. And you have probably seen this graphic before, which shows why the climates are changing. The, we are burning fossil fuels. The carbon dioxide and other gases are entering the atmosphere. Once they get into the atmosphere, they do, are not taken out very readily. It's kind of like leaving an evil genie out of a bottle. And the temperatures keep rising on the Earth since the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. These have now increased exponentially, and we are expecting them to continue to rise. This really threatens the plants and animals in our natural areas, all of the organisms, because temperatures are now hotter than they have ever been recorded before in history. So this is a real problem. But the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is predicting that the temperatures will rise, there will be more drought, there'll be more flooding, and there will also be increased hurricanes. Not, not good news for those of us who live in Louisiana. The thing that actually has me most concerned about these climate projections are the droughts. The, recently, the NASA climate scientists are, this was just published in Science this year, are predicting that we may, by 2050, have 35-year droughts. This is 35 years of droughts in the, the prediction is for the central plains in the southwestern US. And the green, uh, blue, and red boxes are showing the percentages of these models that, that it's an 80% chance of the increase. Now, just to put things a little bit in perspective, Uh, okay, the great, and during the Great Depression, which, where the droughts were really severe, these only lasted for four years. And this has been seared onto the permanent memory of cultural history, I think. But these 35-year droughts, I see as something that, the, you know, the animals and plants in the natural areas are really not going to be able to survive. So I am a, now a wetland, professional wetland ecologist. 
And the wetlands, the freshwater wetlands that I work on are cypress swamps in the southeastern United States, as well as I work in wetlands in other parts of the world. And they're very adapted to a wide range of water environments, flooding, droughts, short-term drought, and they're very good at this. But the thing I don't think that they can survive is a 35-year drought. I mean, what can survive that? I think that there may be seeds that could live in the soil that might survive 35 years of drought, but possibly not. So this is a, a grim future. You might be thinking to yourself, well, she's a professional biologist working in the field. Does she see evidence of climate change? I mean, is this really happening? And unfortunately, the answer is yes, I do see evidence of, of climate change. And I work in some of the most pristine areas in North America. Th this map shows you a dark sky of, map of the, of the United States. This, the lights, of course, show you where the cities are. And so where the cities are not in the no southeastern part of the United States is where my research areas are. These are some of the most pristine sites in the southeastern United States. There are, in many cases, very ancient bald cypress trees. They are as unimpacted of areas as I could find to study. And I am seeing climate change effects in these areas. And this is um, very um, heartbreaking. So in, uh, in 2011 and 12, uh, there, were, there was a drought in Texas, in coastal Texas. And there I began to see the bald cypress trees die. And if you were to see this tree on, the, on your lawn, you would be a little worried, right? Because you see this bark is falling off of the tree. So that's a good indicator that this tree is dying. And so in our survey, we, we found that there were many thousands of trees that were dying um, on the average in this area. So uh, this, was, this was a very bad thing. But the drought was one thing. But also because the temperatures are hotter now, there was more evaporation. And the salinity levels on the coast began to rise. And because these are freshwater trees, they began to die. The other thing that happens in drought is that people need water. Of course, we need fresh water. And during droughts, people need more fresh water. And there becomes a competition between the natural areas and people. And I am afraid that in the future, our natural areas are really going to suffer because of this, because there is not going to be enough water to maintain this, both enough water for humans and the environment. So what can we do? Well, the 19th century naturalists, especially John Muir, had a great idea. Historically, we have saved species and ecosystems by creating national parks and refuges and pristine areas where these species can live and not be altered by humans. So that has been a great system, and I'm so grateful that they set that up for us in the long ago past. But now, temperatures are changing on the Earth, and we have a situation where, whoops, we're going backwards. We have a situation where we need to, uh, where the changes in the atmosphere are actually changing the uh, national parks themselves because the climates are changing. So some of the things that biologists are talking about are that, for example, we could do hydrologic remediation. So in, in times of drought, we could release fresh water to these areas, and this could actually help the trees. And this has been done in, when trees are stressed in both Australia and Louisiana. And this has actually showed a great reviving of the trees in those situations. So that is a good thing, of course, if you have enough water to do that. Another thing that might be done is so that in places where the water is not flowing naturally, you might remove levees, you might breach dams, you might remove dams, and this again would reduce the land use impacts and cause a situation where the trees can again thrive. One thing that's being talked about that's controversial, if climates change too much, it may be that the southern species will actually begin, begin to be too hot and too stressed to live. And they could be put in trucks and moved to the north. And you can imagine how tremendously uh, controversial that problem is, or that 
solution is. So what about if you're not a biologist? What can you do? And I think that there is so much room for people who are not biologists to join into the discussion about the solutions to this problem. The problems that are on us now are very complex. And these are not just problems in biology. They are problems that span many different disciplines. And we need people who are engineers and medical specialists and people who are un good at understanding how people live their lives. We need people in virtually all disciplines who have a very deep understanding of their discipline, but also know how to be good interdisciplinarians. We need people who can step up and who can listen to other people with good ideas and find solutions to these problems. So this is a very necessary thing. Now here's a kind of a showstopper. According to the President's Climate Action Plan, if we reduce our carbon usage by 80%, we can not end the climate change problem. We can merely keep the temperatures from rising any more than they already have. Do you remember the genie in the bottle example that I used? Well, once it's escaped, we can't do so much about it. So this is daunting. right? If you think about it, tomorrow you started using 80% less of the carbon than you do today. So I looked at this and I said, OK, all right, what can I do? So I have re-insulated my house. I've gotten a more efficient air conditioning and heating unit. I grow most of my vegetables and much of what I eat in my garden. I live close to work. Every time I do anything, I say to myself, is there a way that I can do this that's less carbon consuming? Can I use one paper towel, for example? <laughs> <laughs> so all of these things can, can help this situation. But I have what I would call an environmentalist confession to make, because although I have tried to reduce my carbon consumption, my carbon consumption is very high because I work all around the world. I am a feet in the ground mud ecologist, and in order for me to do work with people in other countries, I must go there and go to their swamp and help them with what they're doing. So that's something I'm stuck with. I thought maybe I would add up on one of those calculators online how many trees I've destroyed by these trips. And I thought, no. I started with. in <laughs> the carbon cost from my house to this talk. And I said, OK, I'm not adding up all of these trips by miles and figuring out you know, what my tree cost has been because, um, you know, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> so whatever we do to reduce our carbon usage, and even just beginning to think about it, is useful. But I have to say that I take a tremendous amount of hope from one thing in, in, in solving this problem, and that is that humans are very good complex problem solvers. And we get this trait from our parents and the generations before them. If I think about what my parents had to deal with, well, there was the farm, I told you that story, but they also had to deal with World War II and the Cold War, and their generation dealt with extremely complex problems that, and no other generation had had that, those problems before. And how did they do that? Well, they had learned from the generations before them and they have passed this skill on to us. So this is, our, I think, one of our best tools for the future. You know, we have the ability to do this. We just need to work together and do it. The other thing I wanted to tell you about is that I think this is also a matter of leadership. And I have a very good story for you. There is a woman that I work with at the National Wetlands Research Center named Evelyn. And she won the Department of Interior Bicycle to Work Award in 2014, meaning that she had ridden her bicycle to work more times than anybody in the US who worked for the Department of Interior. So, but the leadership part of this is that wasn't enough. 
The next year, 2015, she organized everybody at the National Wetlands Research Center to ride their bike to work. So during this competition, there were bikes parked everywhere. I've never seen anything like it. It was a wonderful thing. So her leadership led us to actually go from a, a, a very local effort to something that was kind of up into in terms of trees. Now, I looked at the Department of Interior website, and the Department of, the, added up the miles, and the people up from the Department of Interior actually logged enough miles to save more than 7,000 trees. So the point of this is, is that by doing something local, this is the old environmentalist adage, you end up doing something that has a, makes a difference on the global scale. So that's an important point. And the last thing that I want to say is that the, this climate change problem and its, and its implications for conservation can only, be under, can only be solved by people who understand their connection to the earth and their vital role as stewards of the earth.